All right, so we're talking about the dangers of, of uh, pressure cabinets, or blast cabinets, I should say. Uh, I think I told you guys a story about somebody who came back with a handful of plastic pellets. They're all green. And where'd the green come from? Zyglo green. So, oh, from the so somebody had blasted the uh, crank case, didn't pull those little pl you pull those little plugs out, mm -hmm. right? They didn't pull those out. They got in the oil gallery and they packed it inside the oil tubes and uh, the oil gallery. And then when the engine started up, it flushed them all out, went into the system. So not a good thing. So that is one of the big dangers of blast media is that you have to make sure, a hundred percent sure guaranteed there are no pieces of media left otherwise it's pretty nasty on the bearings so that's why i say it took uh we did a water wash the aluminum parts you'd spend a good half hour on a set of crank case apps with little dental picks and blast air and water wash and so water wash everything and then you, you get 100 percent visual through every single cavity and anyway so yeah, after a while you get a, a good knowledge and like where they could be possibly hiding well you look at everything yeah. everything a hundred percent every single galley every single hole you looked at it even if you know like oh yeah they're gonna be in here you you know nah they're never here you still look there anyway so uh, well I'm uh before I start the next subject is your manual yeah. just like any good FAA publication You've got the title page, and you've got some bullshit, and then we start here, right? Well, let's back up to the bullshit. <clears throat> to the owner of this manual, in addition to this manual and subsequent revisions, that means revisions that come after, uh, additional overhaul and repair information is published in the, in the form of service bulletins, service instructions. So in addition to this manual and the revisions, additional overhaul and repair information is published in the form of service bulletins and service instructions. The information contained in these service bulletins and instructions is an integral part of and is to be used in conjunction with the information contained in this overhaul manual. This overhaul manual, the engine operator's manual, and all applicable service bulletins and instructions are issued in compliance with FER 21.5 and shall be used by maintenance personnel in performing actions specified in 43.13, which is uh, maintenance. So, if you own this and you're doing work on your airplane, you must also own and instructions. The FAA shows up and says, ah, you're working on your engine. Uh, you're using a data on that? Yes, I am. I just bought this yesterday from Lycoming. It's guaranteed good. For, it says in there, it goes on. It's good for three years. I'll send you revisions. It's absolutely good. I know I just bought it. And I'll say, mm hmm to read page two. Well, sure. no, I went to the index. What, what's up? I skimmed it. I skimmed it. Yeah, what's up? Well, it says right there, you got to have service forms and instructions because they're an integral part of it. Shall be used in conjunction with this book. You bet that you might need it. Continental's not like that. Their books are much thicker and contain all the stuff. Okay, clean, let's get back into engines here. We got the cleaning part done. Let's talk about the crankcase. And normally I bring the crankcase in, so I'll have to remember to try bringing the crankcase in. Um, why it is the case of the engine. And if you read most manuals, it will say it is like the, um, the what? I'm just guessing housing. No? Housing. Oh, oh, good, good guess. You'll never guess what they all, unless you read the manual, the book, your textbook, which nobody did, because the says the crankcase is like the backbone of your body. Oh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which makes no sense, because, you know, you... Go to the doctor, and you're like, oh, I just got this backache. And they're like, well, your spine, Kevin. Hey, 
It's pieces. like the crankcase of an engine. <laughs> <laughs> like it seems like a rib cage thing, you know? So I don't know why they say that. I guess because it's what everything is built off of, but I don't know. It's not like the backbone, if you ask me. Yes, there you go. It's skin. It holds all the small parts together. Well, but it does have an awful lot of work to do, and everybody knows what the crankcase is. Those are those two big giant aluminum halves that you have that go together. Well, it's two big aluminum halves plus the accessory case plus the sump on the bottom. If you have a continental, big continental engine, then it's just two halves. There is no accessory case. It's all together in one, and then the sump bolts on the bottom. But anyway, everybody can picture the crankcase. Let me see. Do I have pictures of crankcase in here? Got that. Got here. Got that. Oh, yeah. There you go. That stuff about cleaning and all that stuff. Now I know what I'm doing. All right. I'm like, I forgot. We can back up a little bit. Well, we looked at that. See, I think I told you the story. I know I told you the story about the light coming and how I set everything up. And That's me and my ridiculous coat. They made fun of me. Until the next day, everybody asked, where do you get that coat? They all made fun of me. Can you uh, help? You got a coat. You got a coat. Next day, every one of them, you know, hey, psst, did you get that around here? Is there something in the store? <laughs> no. I want to look just like you. Yeah. I don't know what that's about. But I remember I got that there. I'll need it later. Uh, power plant, major alterations. We talked about that. Alterations of power plant. No, we're not going to get into that. Major repairs. We talked about that. Blast cabinets, sorry, we talked about uh, blast cabinets, the safety clean with K, um, pressure washing cabinets, yeah, we covered all that. Media, that's what it looks like, we don't need to look at that. Okay, now we're talking about crankcases. All right, this is a, what I call big bore light combing. Whenever I say big bore light combings, I'm talking about the 470s, 520s, 550s. That's your big bore. Other than that, you go down to the smaller ones, the 360s, 240s, and such. Uh, this particular one is called a per mold case and it's not like I'm just throwing out fancy words Continental is going to talk about their per mold case and you're supposed to go oh yes of course the per mold I know exactly what you're talking about the per mold is easily identifiable by an integral drive alternator which is causing absolutely nothing but problems for, for Continental right now mm -hmm. um, it was a really bad decision to do that but when you have this up here, it's called a per mold case. And if you were to take all of the cylinders off and just look at the case, you go, huh, that's a what? Four cylinder on one side and a three cylinder on the other. But how come that fourth cylinder is just a little bit smaller than the other? They also talk about the seventh stud engine. Um, seven? No. One, two, three, four. That'd be the ninth stud. It's a stud that goes right dead center in the middle of all these and has a little extra plate on it. Uh, but anyway, there's the per mold engine, which has this, versus the sand cast, which does not have that. So that is something they expect you to know. So there we are, the crank case. In case you didn't know, I told you I had pictures. We got the crank case, which is like the skin of your body. Yeah, your backbone, because it holds everything together. All right, but it's got a lot of functions. It's got a lot of work it's got to do. Well, it's uh, well must support itself, much like I, me. Has to support itself, um, which is to say that, yeah, I'll get that. Two uh, it contains all the bearings and everything. All bearings and everything. Yeah, right. That contains the bearings in which crank shaft. I'll put end cam. That is true. But they don't use bearings. They just use a boss for it. Uh, three provide a hopefully. Provide tight enclosure for lubricating oil. Doesn't matter how good the engine is, how powerful it is, if it leaks oil, the owner will.
will hate it and hate the person that built it. Obviously, it's going to support various internal internal and external components. of the power plant, of the power plant, such as magnetos, fuel pump, vacuum pump, prop governor, alternators or generators, the starter, the oil pump, the blah, blah, goes on and on and on, all these things that we must have. I think I got everything, and it provides Mounting for attachment to the airframe. And that's done in a couple different ways. Um, Lycomings tend to have these uh, ears back here, four ears. You can have a straight mount, which is to say that all the bolts just go straight in. Or you can have what they call a dynafocal mount. And a dynafocal mount, they're all angled and rotated so that if you drew a line through every one of the four bolt holes, they would all intersect at about the middle of the engine where the CG is. So that, your more expensive engines, more higher horsepower engines have the dynafocal. Um, Continental small engines will use straight bolts. The big bore engines actually use cradles, uh, legs that just come out of the bottom and sit on a bed. Uh, more of a traditional style of doing things. Oh, provides support and attachment to the cylinders, of course. Got to put the cylinders, cylinders on there, don't you? Almost missed that one. <coughs> provides support and attachment. Four cylinders. All right, materials. What are most blocks and cars made out of these days? Aluminum? Yeah, aluminum alloy. So all of these are going to be aluminum. Aluminum casting. Oh, you're going to like this. So we have the, the older style, which was sand cast. Sand cast. Um, it's much rougher. And you're going to like this at Lycoming, because you're not going to read this anywhere. At Lycoming, they said, hey, no, because Lycoming, they only do the sand cast. It is Continental that does the sand cast and an investment cast. Investment cast is also called the permold, which it uses a whole wax molding thing. It's really kind of neat when you watch how it's done. It takes a while to watch it. But, um, Lycoming says, no, this roughness, that is good. Roughness helps dissipate heat. Which is just proof positive. If you can't do something nice, think of a reason why you did it that way. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that, but I just don't buy into it. That, it doesn't make sense. Well, okay, so on a microscopic level, if you have a, a very smooth surface like a piece of glass, it's like one piece of something that dissipates heat. But now if it's rough, every one of those little rough ridges is like a, a cooling fin sticking up. And they're... Every one of the so it helps dissipate the heat. Now, I'm sure there's some truth to that. It's technically more okay. surface area. It is technically more surface area. You cannot argue that point. Now, I suppose, I don't know, what do you think? They did some sort of test, and if we did a test, we got the, got the permold, and we got the sand cast right next to it. Like, okay, this one's dissipating heat. You know, it's putting a certain amount of heat. Well, this one's like at, you know, 100 degrees, and this one's, well, this one over here, you know, it's rougher, so it's like, 
99.3. So. Thank guys to come up with the stats on uh, climate change. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I keep writing D. All right, B. We're going to write it this time. B. Um, and then we have the per mold. Um, often called investment casting. Um, for continental is integral alternator drive. Otherwise, it, the alternator on a continental is driven out the back of the engine. Why is this alternator causing so many issues for continental? Because it uses a slip coupling on the inside. So when you're building up the engine, you've got a six-cylinder crankshaft and you have the the prop flange and the slinger ring and then right after that you're going to attach a gear so you got to get this gear down around and that's going to bolt on with four bolts and so that's going to go this way and the alternator's got to come in and do a 90 degree drive to it and so there's this this coupling that is going to attach to that and this coupling has got some really bizarre things about it one you have to use a nut on some sort of copper-coated washer. And if you reuse the washer, you're doomed. So um, you have to know that you have to reuse the washer. And you have to have special tools to torque it. You have to cut the cotter pin in a very special way. It's all, you do it by the book. I mean, it's not like it's, ooh. You do it by the book, you don't have a problem. But everybody, so many people are not doing it by the book because it's like, it's a nut, it's a washer. I've been putting nuts on washers and tightening stuff my entire career. How hard could it be? You put it on there, you stick it in a vise, you tighten it till it's tight, you put the cotter pin in, you beat over the edge, you're done. Well, if it's not done exactly the way it's supposed to be done, it starts to work itself loose. And then once it gets loose, it has this like um, silicone, like RTV coupling in there that's designed to slip for some reason. And then if that, that starts to happen, then that starts to come apart. And then the RTV type material that is a slip coupling gets into the oil passages and it blocks the oil passages and then it kills, it uh, starves the engine of oil and then you have a catastrophic failure. Um, so I tell you, I listen to um, on the way home, I love my favorite one is the AOPA. Um, was it there I was? That's yeah. it called? That's there I was. Said, yeah. yeah, and then the other one is uh, I laughed. I learned about flying from that. Um, not as good, um, but still very, very good. So very good, just not compared to the, I like the OPA one better. Uh, Richard McSpadden, you know, I got a little man crush on that guy because he's really cool. Um, anyway, but I believe it was it was that that one because it was a longer episode, and he talked about it was a whole flight. Um, Cirruses have these engines, all the Cirruses, and I think it was a Cirrus or a 206. And, um, doesn't matter. So the guy's in an airplane, right? And it's a single engine and he talks about this flight and he's going and on and on. I don't remember all the details, but what I do remember is there was something about how he was flying and it was like night IFR-ish or some reason why it's like, you know, hey, my, his alternator started giving him trouble. And he's, he's going cross country. I mean, he's going from one to te Texas to Idaho or something. So he's got to stop halfway in between. What was it, the, you know? Uh, spends a night somewhere, very inconvenient, uh, you know, calls the shop in the morning, hey, can you look at my airplane? I had an alternator failure, if you can get another, yeah, oh, yeah, hey, you know, we're familiar, we get an alternator. You know, a couple hours later, they call him up, hey, you better come down here and take a look at this. And uh, they, they, they get some, they show him, and the coupling is disintegrated. Um, the, because that gear became loose, that gear riding on the other gear, those two gears were not riding correctly anymore, so they made a bunch of metal. All the metal went through his engine. The engine is high. They pulled the screen, the filter. It's highly contaminated with, with all the gear shavings. They're like, you didn't lose an alternator. You lost your engine. And based upon the amount of metal shavings and parts we found in the screen, they, whatever, they estimated that he was probably going to make it maybe another 15 to 20 minutes before this engine seized up. So he's lucky he landed. Well, it's an, it, the story is... Oh, it was. I laughed because of the rest of the story. So I learned about flying from that because their sponsor is a Vemco insurance. And so, um, so it was I laughed. And um, so it was a factory reman engine. It's a factory new engine. And so they got the factory involved. And what they found was the cotter pin, the special cotter pins. They got to be bent a special way. They didn't bend it at all. They found it completely 
unbent in the oil sump. Yeah. And so we had this huge case against Continental, and the Continental was like, well, you're out of warranty. And uh, so, so we called this insurance company, who was a Vemco, because this was sponsored by a Vemco. And a Vemco said, yeah, this is a, something we're going to cover, a new engine for you. Uh, should like uh, Continental not step up? And then um, Continental eventually came around and said, you know what, we've researched this, we've looked, yeah, we've, we're going to warranty your engine, give you a brand new engine. And, and they did, they stepped up and said they made a mistake. But eventually. eventually, after a lot of heartache, but you know, and it's just what, if IO520, IO or TSI 520? It's probably 80 grand, that's all. I mean, it's like, you know, you yeah, probably yeah. had one at home just in case this one went bad, right? All right, so you got to know the difference between the permold and the sand cast because Continental's really bad about saying that. Like, for the permold engines, do this. For the sand cast, do this. You're like, I don't know. It's the alternator, so you're going to look for the alternator. All right, uh, let's see. D. There's obviously multiple sections. You have two, if you just want to call it crankcase, so the opposed. has two sections. The left and the right, the one, the three, odd, the odd side and the even side. They are non-interchangeable. You cannot have a crack in the one, three side and call up somebody and go, ah, I just need a right side. They are a match set for life. They're like penguins, if that's mm -hmm. true. When one goes bad, the other is bad. So they're a match set, non-interchangeable. Match set. All right, so you got left and the right. Well, but if we get into radial engines, we can have a bunch of them. Radial engines will have three to seven sections or more. So this one got a front, then the nose section, which will contain the thrust bearing. In case you remember, every engine, I mean, it's supposed to produce thrust, and that thrust is the prop, and the prop pulls on the crankshaft, and the crankshaft has to somehow pull on the crankcase. The crankcase is attached to the airframe and it pulls the airframe. So everything's got to pull on something. And we'll talk more about the bearings and the thrust bearing in this in a little bit. Uh, then this has the power section. This is a two-piece power section. So if it's a two-piece power section, it probably uses a single-piece crankshaft. If it's a one-piece one crankcase, then it's going to usually use a two-piece crankshaft. Where you actually bolt the crankshaft together. So power uh, nose, power section. This particular one probably has a diffuser or blower section, which will have a centrifugal compressor, about the same size diameter as the engine, where air comes in the middle, is spun out to the outside, where it goes through these pipes, which are then going to be uh, aimed at the cylinders. So after the diffuser section, then we'll get into the accessory section. The accessory section will have all the gears to drive magnetos, fuel pumps, oil pumps, and all that stuff. So let's see, three to seven sections. Let me see. Uh, you can have the front or nose section. Nose. And that usually contains the thrust bearing. The bearing that takes the thrust load. Uh, you'll have the main section, main or power section. Uh, it could be one or two piece. The picture I showed you is a two piece. One or two piece. Uh, maybe see, we have the blower or diffuser section.
So I, I know like the Lycoming uh, radial engines, they have a diffuser. And then you go up a little bit to like the next, would be the 985s, they have a blower. And to look at them, they look exactly the same. You wouldn't know that the Lycoming diffuser isn't a blower. The only reason why it's not a supercharger, it doesn't turn fast enough. It just turns at a rate, I think one to one, uh, that takes the fuel air mixture and distributes it out to the cylinders evenly. You go down one to the Continental, uh, like the, on the VW, uh, where it's only seven cylinders, it does not have a diffuser section. It just comes in through the um, carburetor into the intake manifold system around the engine. Um, so really the difference between a diffuser and a supercharger or blower is just how fast you turn it. The uh, 2800 that we have sitting by the hot seat washer, have you guys seen that plugged in yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I can plug it in for you. Anybody can plug it in, it doesn't turn real fast. You know, the propeller turns at a rate about like this. And you can watch all the valves go and the pistons move about this rate. But you take a flashlight and get underneath it. Remember, it's sitting this way. It's supposed to be this way. It's just on a stand. Get down underneath and find the diffuser blower. That blower booking it. Even as slow as that prop <coughs> is turning, that blower is really moving. It's a, it's a blur. That's how fast it's going. And I believe that's a two-speed blower. So somewhere on there, there should be a... Uh, uh, not a clutch, but a, a handle where you can clunk it and it'll either go faster or slower. I don't know which position it's in now. Hmm. But they're usually two speeds. Uh, let's see, right here, the blower diffuser, and then I got the accessory section. Obviously, if it's a twin, so that's one, two, three, four sections. I said three to seven, because like the little Continental doesn't have a blower diffuser section. Um, but if we had a twin row radial, we're going to add two more pieces in the main. So that'd be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six right there. And I think sometimes the excess, uh, the nose I know can be several sections. So just add them in there. All right. All right. So the opposed engines, back to the opposed, they use through bolts. All right, those are the big long bolts that go from one side to the other. And now don't you feel a little foolish when you guys are taking your engines apart and you're like, whoa, can we take off all the nuts that these things have? Is just gonna fall? Ah, it's got bolts about that long going through the other side, huh? So they weren't gonna fall. You gotta pull them apart like, what, six to eight inches before they'll actually come apart. So, nah, they weren't going anywhere. But it's good you cared. Uh, so opposed to have through bolts, uh, we have two types two types of, of through bolts, and this is for Continental and Lycoming. Um, we have the fixed, which is what you have, and then there's the full floating. The floating, floating, F-L-O-A-T-I-N-G, floating, floating. In other words, they're not anchored to anything. So if you had floating, and sometimes Lycoming uses both, uh, especially the, the center two are floating. So they'll have like anchored and then floating in the middle, if I remember correctly. Uh, the floating ones, you can just tap them with a hammer uh, before you take the engine apart. And because they're dialed, they're very stiff in there. Mm -hmm. So you take a rod and you just tap them all the way out and they come out the other end, you set it down, then you got a bolt about yay long, it's a through bolt. Take out the other side right next to it and then you can tap on the, the uh, anchored ones and the case comes apart. Uh, Continental just tends to use floating all the way up and down. Now the problem with floating is that it takes two people to put an engine together. So you can't so you torque one side, it pulls it this way, torque the other side. So when we did Continentals, um, you guys bet Nathan, he came in here the other day? Mm -mm. I was here Friday. I should have introduced you. Um, that was my, my, uh, my partner in crime there, building engines. So we had a little, little dance thing we did to put engines together. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so we got the through bolts. Let me take a look at pictures here. Get that. Okay, I see where we're going now. When you said dance, I like to think it was to the hokey pokey. I didn't <laughs> think much about it until when I was working at uh, working with him over the COVID break because I wasn't here, and uh, we had to put some engines uh, uh, 
an engine back together and so I said you know it had been years since we'd done it and I said you ready go and the other guys kind of made fun of us like damn man you guys have clearly done this before <laughs> you guys have it like down to a science it's hilarious I'm like yeah we've done a few uh, not to brag it's just he's a fun guy and I like him so Amazing. it's more about him being cool all right so like let's take a look at this light coming right here does it have anchored or floating Has both. Both. So the f floating, floating, anchored. Did you say iron spoke? No, you have anchored. I thought there's two at the very. No, you have anchored the other side. So you have some anchored this way and four anchored that way. Yeah, I was going to say those. The two oh, the two. Ah, those are just your three eighths nose bolts there. I wouldn't call them through bolts, but I can see your point. I wouldn't say you're wrong. Um. There's so much to say about this engine here, uh, but we'll get back to that. Uh, let's see. Well, while we're on this picture, when you put these engines together, you will note that they are a machine surface. And there's so much to say. All right, first of all, it's a highly machined surface. It's a machine parting flange. And that's supposed to be, an, uh, you know, sealed, oil sealed. So you got to put it together with something. Well, Lycoming's got a couple of things that you're allowed to use. In here, we're going to use uh, POB uh, number four and silk thread. And uh, I use a double silk thread. And it's funny because the directions say something to the effect of, and make sure the silk thread goes on both sides of the bolts. Right? When they say both sides of the bolts, they are talking about, let me see if I have one that's more. There we go. Both sides of the bolts. In other words, okay, and so notice how they did this. This is, this is done, I think, reasonably well. You, it's a double string. I always put one here in this corner. I need a pen, please. Pen. Start a string in this corner right here at that edge and come out and another one right in the middle. And this is the brown stuff. It's the plyo bond. It gets tacky. You're going to read the directions. Put a little bit in this area because it holds the silk thread. And you're going to run a silk thread around mm. okay and both sides which means this side and this side well they did this side and then around and then this side that's both sides but it's always going to run this side of the bolt hole mm. all right so that's what they mean by both sides and i run a double double so you got to make sure yeah and you, you put something on every single time you join the case house or only during the final assembly only during the final assembly. Okay. Yeah, because this is the, the final sealant. And it uses a double lot silk thread, which is very, very thin. Uh, Continental uses a much thicker thread, but this is such a tiny little thread. According to the guy at Lycoming School, I just want to turn off the camera right now. Um, <clears throat> the thread is meant to wear away. And the, no, it's not. I'm going to tell you why I, I think that was just not true. Um, no offense. Um, but anyway, you're going to run the silk thread and the POB. Uh, Continental uses the most bizarre thing. And they're very, very specific about how, and I have to look it up every time to get it exactly right. One side uses this like plyobond stuff. The other side uses a different chemical. And you put the two together. One is Loctite 515. Um, and then the other side's like plyobond. And so you got brown on this side and pink on this side. By the way, this is, uh, that's the POB right there. Uh, not POB, that's the Loctite 515. Lycoming does have an alternate sealing method where they allow you to use this, which is fine, but we're, we're going to do the silk thread method. Um, so you just got to watch your surface bolts. But anyway, so you put the silk thread in there. Um, they said, yeah, silk thread will eventually wear away, leaving only the plyo bond. Okay, so here's where I wanted to go with this. Highly machined surface. And if, in fact, it's a highly machined surface, and if, in fact, you put it together correctly, then those two highly machined surfaces should not... Need. 
rub. We call that fretting, all right? Which is funny because when you worry about something, you're fretting about it. Well, that literally means micro movement. And so what you get, and ask me out in the field, the shop, start looking for this in your, your engines now and come and ask me, hey, do I have this? You get fretting starts around these center mains right here, this saddle area, that saddle with those mating. And what you will see is a frosted appearance. It no longer looks like somebody machined something. It's all pitted and frosty. Um, and then it starts growing. It starts growing from here, and then it grows to here, and then up, and they'll start frosting just the bottom side here, and then eventually all of it. What that is from is mechanics not properly torquing the case halves together. So I have taken apart a lot of factory remands. And let me tell you right now, like homing, engines are fretted. Now, I get engines in, like I had to take some of mine apart, thankfully not because I broke them, because they're like prop strikes, and you hold your breath going, oh, please, I hope I did this right. Let me please say that I, why no fret? Mine didn't fret. It's just a matter of taking the time, the care, to do good torquing procedures and using, my, my words, a lot of oil on your nuts and bolts. I mean, I'm serious. Well, you have to, I make a freaking mess. Like coming and they put their engines together, and then paint them. I paint mine, then put it together. I don't think I could paint mine after the fact. There's too much oil everywhere. Because when I'm getting ready to put a cylinder on, I mean, I pour it in the cylinder, literally pour the oil. And I take my hand and I rub it all over. And it's just like, man. And then I take the rings and the piston and I pour it in there. And I work the rings around. It's like, damn, that's a lot of oil, dude. Yeah, it is. And I put it together and then it's running out of the spark plug hole. And then I, you're supposed to oil the, um, the studs, right? And then the nuts that go on, right? I take a, a you guys right now have a little squirt can. I can't work with that. I'm going to give you a quart can with a one inch brush. You scoop it in there and I, I slather it. It's running all over the floor. My clothes are all greasy. You can barely hang on the nuts. That's how I torque an engine. Yeah, I've seen the factory. They're very neat and clean, you know? And I'm like, nope, if you want oil, you're getting oil, damn it. And, uh, but it works, right? Um, and if you have through bolts, you torque both of them simultaneously. Um, so that's, that's all very important. So that's my, my spiel. With that method, is it only one side of the crankcase, I guess? Yes, you only put one side, this method, only one side gets the POB with the silk thread. Yeah, you know, so you want it real clean when you put it back together. And note, there's O-rings here. You gotta be careful when you put O-rings. Like when you put these, this is anchored. So when you put these O-rings in, you can't run the O-rings down the threads. You'll ruin them. So I had a whole bunch of little tools that I made up on a lathe out of phenolic that would just barely go over the that. And then it had it was like a cone. And so it'd start with a cone and it'd go down. But Use paper. I, binder paper works great. Just tear a piece of binder paper, wrap it uh, a turn or two around there, twist the end, and then you made a tool. So just protect your O-rings. The other thing is um, the other side is chamfered for O-rings, like right there. So what I can see happening right here is they're going to put the O-ring in there, and then they're going to put the case halves together, and then they're going to push the through bolts through. And when they push that through bolt through, they're going to take a bunch of O-ring material with it. So you can't do that. You have to put the through bolts through, then put the O-rings on, and you can't let them slide back out. I hope you don't understand what I'm saying. But don't, don't push bolts or nuts, or, sorry, bolts or through bolts through these O-rings once they're in the case. I think you guys have that with yours, the nose, where you have that 3 8 big bolt. It's tempting to put it together with the O-ring in there and then shove the bolt through. Yes, because sir. you're squeezing the O-ring a little bit when it goes in there, then you shove that bolt through, and the threads just rip the O-ring apart. And then you have a leak. And guess how you change out those O-rings? Take the whole engine apart. It's not hard. So does the thread have some sealing property? Or the thread? Yeah, well, uh -uh. what's the purpose? Oh, oh, the so silk thread. Yeah. yeah, 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 it's a sealing property. So it, it smashes. <laughs> So when you take an engine apart that was done right and you take it apart, um, you can't even pick it up and, and move it at that point. And if it's been together a long time, you should actually see both 
both pieces of silk thread, and it's just flat as, as can be. But it's there, and it's still sealing after all those years. Um, might as well tell you this story. I'm telling you stories. Your Lycoming overhaul manual is going to tell you to put together your engine this way. You see, it's out on blocks, and it tells you to lay the, one of the halves down. And then you, um, these bearings are a real pain in the ass. I'll talk about those later. Um, but you, you build it this way. Um, you have a single piece bearing here and a single piece here. I'm sorry. You have a bearing here and a bearing here. That one, that one, that one, and that one. They're all the same. But most light comings look like this. You got the bearing here and the bearing here, but this is a one piece. But what's crazy is the split is right here. You can't see it, but it's split right under the little hand. So it that's why it's already on there. And it has a little hole right here and a little hole right here. I know this others. Yeah, they go on these dowels. Mm. And so you have to put this all together. And I would build it this way first. I would put the crank in this side. So you, um, the way I do it, you have to do a little different because I build mine vertically. But I put the bearing on the crank and then I bring this case half up to the crankshaft and these little dowels have to go in the right holes. If you miss, those dowels push into the bearing, and, you, and then when you built the engine, you can't move it. It's locked up. And that's happened. Not to me, but uh, somebody else I know. Um, so anyway, but the, what you're supposed to do, and, and I do, is there's a red line right there, pencil mark, and a pencil mark there, and a pencil mark there. So what they did is they, you, they put it in the case, and um, you draw pencil marks so you can identify that it's set incorrectly, and then you bring the other one. But anyway, here's what I want to tell you. So the light coming manual tells you to build it this way. Put it on blocks, set it down, put this half in there, put the bearing in, do that. Put the, uh, I would put the cam over on this side so you don't have to deal with it, but you can see they wired nylon tied it in there. So anyway, then you're gonna take this case off and you're gonna try and put it on here. But in order to do that, you have to lift up this rod and this rod and you gotta try and get it through those holes at the same time that you're trying to get this down onto there without messing any bearings up. And oh, by the way, oh, that's right. You gotta put it in this half and wire it. Otherwise, when you turn it upside down, the tappets are gonna fall out. So I go to Lycoming School and I know it says this in the manual. And uh, you got the nose seal, it's gotta all be in there. So you try putting all this together. And I, I did it this way once in the field and I saw it. I know now why I don't ever do this. It really sucks. So I go to light coming school. I'm like, this is the way we do it. And I'm not going to argue with them. I'm, I want to see this. So I think I was the last guy, according to my story, to actually get my case half on. So the first, first group that did it dropped the rods onto the case. You can hear it across the room. Bang! Trying to get everything in. And they dropped it here, dropped it there, dropped it on there. Next group. Drop, drop, drop. Next group. Drop, drop, drop. All right, my turn. I'm going to use three people. I will not drop my rods on the crankcase. I swear to you, I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. That's all I cared about. And guess what I did? Drop the freaking rods onto the case. It's impossible and it's obnoxious. That's why I build my engines vertically. I do not follow this procedure, which I do not believe is a violation of the manual in any way, shape, or form. I do it exactly like they say, just not horizontal, vertical. But just like you took it apart, put the crankcase on, bring one half up this way, put the rods where it's supposed to go, bring the other half this way. I'll show you how to do it. Never drop a rod because it's impossible to drop a rod and it works perfect every time. So that's just the way I want to do it. All right. Well, I guess that's a story kind of. Were you tempted to bolt it to the table vertically? <laughs> no, I was really minding my P's and Q's. And yeah. I was there to learn what they had to say and I had zero input. In fact, the. Uh, the teacher got mad at me once.